Hello and welcome back. And today we've got two Centurion projects that I want to tackle and they're actually kind of unrelated. But uh, first things first, in the previous episode, the one that aired last week, not the previous episode in the Centurion series, but in that episode we were working on the Bendix G15 and we got the rotating drum memory assembly out of it. And that rotating drum is very heavily crashed, so we need to do a, a drum swap on it. And I'm going to take the rotating drum out of the Bendix G15 that's on display at System Source Museum and bring it back to put into our machine here. Uh, so what that means is that uh, I am going to be driving all the way up to Maryland to do the swap. And that swap is going to happen on October 23rd. And we're actually going to be doing a uh, open house at the museum. Museum. So if you guys find yourself bored on October 23rd, come hang out with us at System Source Museum. Uh, we'll be working on the Bindex, but we'll also be looking at all of the other really epic machines that Bob has in his collection up there. Uh, it's going to be a massive amount of fun. So uh, come hang out with us at System Source on October 23rd. I'll put all of the information to that in the description below. Uh, uh, date, time, address, uh, links to the website, all of that stuff. Uh, so go check that out and come join us. Hope to see you there. But that doesn't have a direct connection to what we're working on today, except for the fact that I'm going to be driving up to Maryland. And that's an excellent time to uh, maybe divert a little bit up towards uh, Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is where Butler Tech is, and that is where the Desk System Centurion is. And that is one of the projects that I want to tackle today. Uh, the other project is this little floppy drive right here, which I got from Curious Mark, and it's going to be installed in our primary system here. So we're working on the two Centurions that I have here in the room, but they're uh, unrelated to each other. So each section is going to be kind of like its own little self-contained episode. You're getting a two-for-one deal in this one. Well, yeah, that's one plus two plus one plus one. Even if you were right, that would be one plus one plus two plus one, not one plus two plus one plus one. So we're going to start with the uh, Butler Tech system because I've got a lot of work to still do on it to make sure that when we get to Cincinnati, everything works perfectly. So let's hop over to that system and get started. About six months ago, we were on our way back from VCF East, and I swung by Cincinnati, where there's a school called Butler Tech. This is a technical high school, and it's just epic. It's really, it's what I wish my high school was like. <laughs> they have a full machine shop. They've got auto classes. They've got tech classes. They've got arts classes. It's everything that you wanted as a high schooler. Uh, so I want to thank Butler Tech, first of all, for uh, letting me gallivant around their high school and uh, look at all of the amazing things that they have set up there. But also, Mr. Hall is one of the staff members there, and he runs the IT department. And Mr. Hall got his hands on a uh, desk system Centurion. These are incredibly rare. It's a full-fledged Centurion mini computer built into a desk. It's really awesome. Now they came with a bit of a smaller backplane, a little seven slot backplane, but they had a full honest to God Hawk drive bolted to the bottom of the desk. Really epic stuff. And so when I swung by Cincinnati, our goal was to get that machine going. But we couldn't quite get there. There were too many unknowns, there were too many kind of broken things, and I didn't want to rush it for fear of potentially damaging it or destroying it in a way that was unrecoverable. Uh, so instead I talked to Mr. Hall, and he's absolute legend, he let me bring back this card cage right here. This is the full CPU 5 card cage that came out of that Centurion desk system. Uh, like I said, it's a 7 slot backplane, has a CPU 5 uh, processor card in it, disk 1 and disk 2 controller cards for the Hawk drive, a 4 port MUX card for talking to the data terminal and the TI-810 serial printer that they have, as well as a 32k memory card. Now, in this room, if excluding this one that's sitting in my lap right now, I have two Centurion mini computers. I have the primary system that we have that we always do all of our main work on. That is a CPU 6 system over there, and we're actually going to do a little more work on it later in this episode. And I have this system right here. This is the Centurion that travels with me to shows, so I can let people get hands-on with the actual machine. Now, I built this cabinet from scratch, and uh, the card cage and all of the cards in it were taken from the counterfeit Centurion system. But inside 
side, we have a uh, CPU 6, a 128K memory card, disk 1 and disk 2 controller card for the Hawk drive, and a uh, four port MUX card for talking to the data terminal. The only thing that it doesn't have is a set of heads for the removable platter. Uh, that's because long before we ever got our hands on this Hawk drive, there was a failed uh, power supply. This probably happened about 20 to 30 years ago, uh, and it fried three out of the four heads. Now, I was able to salvage a head out of a different Hawk drive, and we were able to turn this into a fixed-only uh, Hawk drive. So it only has one disk in it, so it's a 5 megabyte drive instead of a 10 megabyte drive. But if you're actually not trying to do real legitimate business work from the 1980s on it, five megabytes is well more than enough for uh, experiencing everything that this system has to offer. So we're in an interesting spot because I have two CPU six systems here, but Butler Tech has a CPU five system. And actually, I can't provide software support for a CPU-5 system because the CPU-5 and the CPU-6 are pretty dramatically different. They do share a core instruction set architecture, but the CPU-6 is so much more expanded that obviously anything written for the CPU-6 can't run on a CPU-5. But also, any applications written for the CPU-5 can't run on the CPU 6 unless they're recompiled for it. So talking with uh, Mr. Hall, we kind of came up with a bit of a game plan. And I am in love with this CPU 5. I really want to learn more about it, learn more about its limitations and its differences to the CPU 6. So we're going to keep the CPU 5 here. We're going to take the CPU 5 and the 32K memory card and we're going to put them in this cabinet. And then we're going to take the CPU 6 and the 128K memory card out of this cabinet and put it into this card cage. But we're also gonna swap Hawk drives. This single platter Hawk is gonna go up to Butler Tech because it has a full-fledged operating system on it already and all of the applications that we know that they can run and I can clean it up and get everything really nice so that they have a turnkey system up there and then we can provide uh, software support moving forward from there because we know exactly what they have. And then the CPU 5 Hawk drive that they have in their system is going to come home with me and get installed back into this cabinet. Now this Hawk drive has a lot of extra junk on it that's uh, showed up from various shows that we've gone to making basic programs and stuff like that. I need to clean all of that off. I need to uh, maybe write a little bit of a help file and I need to confirm one thing hardware wise that I haven't yet confirmed. And that is that the CPU 6 and the 128K memory card work fine in this seven slot backplane. So we're gonna fill this backplane out exactly as it'll be in Cincinnati. We're gonna hook up the Hawk drive to this backplane and we're gonna fire it all up, make sure everything works and get the drive essentially to a turnkey state. Okay, I pulled out the uh, spare power supply I have. I have it hooked up to the CPU-5 backplane. Uh, I have the CPU-6, disk 1, disk 2, 128K memory card, all and MUX card all installed into this. I have confirmed that uh, the bootstrap ROM is working. That's why we got error up here. So it's working as far as we can get without having the Hawk drive spun up. So I went ahead and spun up the Hawk drive. We'll flip the power switch on here. Uh, and then I'll hit the restart button here, and there we go. We got three uh, RTZs, name equals. That's <laughs> excellent news. Uh, we'll do et osn1 code equals. We should get all the way into the operating system now. Yeah, there we go, 0823.84. CRT0 ready if we do a .sta. There we go. The CPU-6 works just fine in this back plane. So this is the exact setup that's going to Butler Tech. This back plane, these cards, this drive, all going up to Butler Tech. It is confirmed working. Now it's a little janky setup like this. I'm not a big fan of this. I'm gonna break something. So I'm gonna pull all these cards out, put them back into this card cage, uh, and then spin this thing up again so I can get to work on cleaning up the uh, installation that we have in there. Set a salutation message and do a bunch of other things that will get it ready for Butler Tech. All right, we've got it all back together. Let's boot into the operating system again. We'll type H1 here. 
There we go, max disk equal one. We'll type in today's date, 0823.84. And then we'll do a dot STA. And we're right back up to where we were. So we wanna do a little bit of cleanup on uh, the hard drive initially. So if we do a dot DIR1 here, uh, we've got all of the basic stuff that we need. We've got uh, the operating system, we've got the S folder that has all of our utilities in it, the P folder that allows us to uh, compile new assembly programs or CPL programs, the question mark folder that has all of our uh, diagnostic programs in it, um, and then a lot of the stuff below that is uh, temporary files and stuff like that, things that we don't need to worry about. We have the GL folder, that's for the general ledger. All of that is staying. Uh, but when we get to the uh, second page here, we can see we got a bunch of stuff going on here. A bunch of this stuff is uh, files that were created while we were at an event, making new basic programs for people and running things like that. So I need to go through and just kind of clean all of these up. There's no reason for those to uh, really be in there. So we can clean them up pretty easily by doing a uh, .del. Uh, we'll delete uh, xmark, for example, here. xmark. Uh, and then just one. Uh, WP1 means that I have write protect on. We'll turn the write protect off. There we go. We deleted that file. We've got about 20 more files to delete, so I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna get to work. It's gonna take a while. All right, that's looking much cleaner, much more manageable. Uh, the big thing that this machine would have been used for would have been general ledger stuff. So that is still on the drive here. If we type GL menu, uh, it'll say enter the key number for the file set. That's gonna be 100 uh, and then disk number one. And this gets us into the general ledger. From here, it gets super confusing. And I'm gonna do a full video on how to use the general ledger and how you would use one of these machines in anger in the future. But for now, I just wanted to make sure that that program, that application is on this hard drive, ready for the students at uh, Butler Tech to play around with. And it definitely looks like it's still working correctly. So we're all good to go there. So we'll uh, do 99 processing completed out of that. Uh, there is one more change that I do want to make, and that is in the sysgen uh, utility. So we'll do p.sysgen. Uh, that is not in a library. Uh, the configuration file name is at osn, and that is on disk number one. And then from this menu, we want to select seven for salutation messages. Uh, this is the message that shows up right at the very beginning when you boot the system. Right now, there's absolutely nothing in here. So I want to write something so that people know how to uh, boot fully into the system because it can be a little confusing the first time that you turn it on. So we'll start with something like, say, uh, welcome to the Centurion. And then on the next line, we'll say uh, press new line when the uh, max disk equal one message shows up. Uh, and then we'll say something about date and time, maybe uh, enter appropriate, I hope I spelled that right. Uh, that's definitely not spelled right. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me get my cameras rolling. I don't know how to spell stuff. We'll Google appropriate, make sure I got it spelled correctly here. <laughs> uh, let's see, here we go. A-P-P-R-O-P-R-I-A-T-E, space. There we go. Enter appropriate <laughs> date and time uh, when prompted. And then finally, we'll say uh, when CRT0 ready is displayed, system is fully booted. Uh, and then maybe a type dot STA to see a system status, type dot dir space one to see a file uh we'll say to see a drive directory i guess 
directory listing. I don't know. Uh, that looks pretty good. Um, so I think we're going to stick with that. To get out of this, we have to hit uh, Control B uh, for Enter. I guess I could have just hit F4. I've got the actual function keys on this one. Uh, so we'll hit 9 to end the program. Uh, no, we don't want a listing. Uh, so now we're back up to the main screen here. Uh, I will reset the machine, uh, and then we'll do H1, and we should see our salutation message. There it is. Welcome to the Centurion. Press new line when max disk equal 1 message shows up. There we go, max disk equal 1. Enter appropriate date and time when prompted, uh, 08-2384. And then it tells us when CRT0 ready is displayed, system is fully booted. There we go, CRT0 ready. And we can do a .sta to view a status screen. Uh, I think that's going to get it pretty close to sorted for the uh, students at Butler Tech to use. I think, I think we're ready to get that desk system going. I just have to get up to Cincinnati. There's one last thing that we need to fix before we are 100% ready to go to Cincinnati and get that machine set up. This is the front panel for the uh, CPU5 system, um, and it has two momentary push buttons and one uh, latching push button, uh, this one here. This push button and this push button both still actually work, um, but this one here in the middle you can see is very, very broken. Uh, what happened was the Hawk drive slid off the rails and when it did, it slammed into the bottom of this and bent and broke a bunch of things. So even this switch over here, even though it actually does still work, it is also broken. The front area of it here is all chewed up. So I'm gonna replace both of these switches, uh, but that is, interesting because these are kind of hard to find, uh, except that I have a viewer, Lynn, who has uh, sent me a couple of care packages full of all sorts of goodies. And in one of the packages was all of this. <laughs> we have some push buttons for sure. Uh, these ones in particular, I think are dead ringers. I think we can actually use uh, these two right here these two right here to replace these two failed ones here. Um, I just need to desolder these and solder these two in. Now these are latching, uh, but I think we can turn them into momentary by just removing this little uh, metal piece right here. I'm pretty sure that just pulls right out and then it'll be a nice momentary switch. Uh, so I'm going to fire up the soldering iron, we'll desolder those, put the new ones in, turn them into momentary switches and we'll be good to go. In order to get the switches out, I need to pry up the tabs on the metal mounting bracket first. It was fiddly, but once they're bent up and out of the way, we can now get to work on desoldering the switches. And for this, I'm going to use my trusty Radio Shack desoldering iron. I absolutely love this thing, and it made quick work of getting the solder off the pads. But the top side still had a bit of solder left, so I just heated it up with the normal soldering iron and pried up with a little tool, walking the switch right out. Uh, next, we'll remove this little metal tab, converting the switch from a toggle switch to a momentary switch. And then we just gotta slip the new switch into the metal mounting bracket and bend the tabs over, holding it in place. And finally, it's time to just solder the new switches in. There we go, good as new. And actually these feel way better than that other one did. This one was uh, very much so broken and not in good shape. So it's a good thing that we got these on here. Unfortunately, I only have one of these little black caps that go over the end. I don't really know where to get more of those. So if anybody does know where to get more of those, uh, leave a comment down below because I'll buy them up and send them up to Cincinnati so they can uh, put the proper buttons in place. So Lynn, I wanna thank you so much for the care package and uh, sending along these little push buttons. These absolutely rescued this part of the build and they're gonna live on in the system up in Cincinnati. So thank you so much for that. All right, I think we got everything squared away for the Butler Tech system. We got uh, everything on the hard drive that I wanted on the hard drive. The uh, hardware all works in the appropriate backplane, and we got that little front panel switch fixed. So it's pretty much ready to go up to Cincinnati and get that machine up and going. And that's what we'll do next month. Uh, when we get back from Cincinnati, we'll go through and I want to do a little bit of refreshing on the cabinet for our mini Centurion over there. So we'll uh, finish off the conversion to a full CPU 5 system and kind of refresh that cabinet once we get back. So that one will look nice and 
complete. But speaking of complete systems, I really want to get this main cabinet complete and it's really close right now. We've got a fully stacked card cage on the bottom, we've got a fully working hawk in the middle, and we just have this kind of open area up top here. And what I want to do for that is I want to put the floppy drive and the finch behind there. This is how Centurion actually did it with systems that were equipped with uh, floppy drives back in the day. They would put one floppy drive dead square in the center of the panel. Sometimes they had systems with two floppy drives, in which case they would offset them evenly. Uh, but our FFC card only supports a single floppy drive and up to three finches. So we're going to put the floppy drive dead square in the middle of this panel. Uh, but that raises a couple of problems. The first is that the floppy drive that we've been using is this nice little NEC uh, half height 8 inch drive and it works wonderfully well except that it's half height. Centurion never used a half height drive. They only ever used full height drives. So I don't want to uh, mount this in the middle here because it'll look really funky and it's not the right drive for this system anyways. This floppy drive is the right drive for this system. This is a magnetic peripherals or a CDC full height, double-sided, double density, eight inch floppy drive. I was hanging out in uh, San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, hanging out with none other than Curious Mark. Yes, the Curious Mark. And it was just such an awesome trip. I had so much fun hanging out in uh, Mark's lab down there, working on random stuff, looking at the unbelievable collection of equipment that he has. And it was, it was just so much fun. Mark, if you're watching, thank you so much for that. It was uh, truly a once in a lifetime experience. But Mark had uh, about eight of these CDC floppy drives. And that's because these are the drives that also came in it's a dual eight inch floppy drive uh, cabinet that's meant for HP computers. And Mark has a bunch of them with some spare drive. So we worked together to get these drives up and going. And uh, he very kindly donated this one to the Centurion because it is the right drive for this computer. So we're gonna take Mark's drive here get it mounted onto a tray, which I happen to have right here. Uh, this is just a little generic tray that I got off of uh, Amazon. And then we're gonna drill a hole in a spare front panel that we have here and get it all mounted up and mounted right behind here. We're also gonna mount the Finch drive right next to it, which is this one over here. This is an eight inch hard drive that we got going in the previous episode. So we're gonna mount that on this same tray and then we can have both the Finch and the floppy on a tray that you can pull out and access right up here on the top where it's supposed to be. Now, I'm really excited about this because I think it's gonna look awesome, but we have some pretty heavy duty work to do. And I think we're gonna start with uh, this front panel here because this panel is actually a spare one from this chassis So it actually has a slightly different mounting method. So we got to bend some metal and cut a big hole So uh, we'll start with this and then slowly work our way forwards First things first. I need to get the back side of this panel nice and clean This originally had some kind of foam sound deadening on it and it's just a mess now. So I'll take a razor blade to it and scrape it as clean as I can. Uh, and then I'll just vacuum up the results of my work and it's already looking immensely better. Uh, next, I wanna get the original panel off of the Centurion. And to do that, I need to pop the side panels off. Then it's just two little bolts and the filler panel pulls right off the front. Uh, and here you can see the insane difference in mounting styles between the cabinets. This extra protrusion was meant for the later style cabinet that the Phoenix drive is currently in, and it's not going to work at all. But I don't want to just cut it off. So instead, I'll line it up in the vise and uh, start to bend it inwards and out of the way. Then I'll get it back over on the bench and I'll put some serious weight into it and bend it all the way in, something that I couldn't do completely on the vise. Uh, and this should be able to clear the cabinet just fine and hopefully give us a place to build some brackets to mount this front panel to the tray. But before we get that far, let's uh, get to work on cutting out the hole for the floppy drive. 
I'll start by drawing an X right in the center using a straight edge going from corner to corner. And just to double check that I'm truly at the center point, I'll also measure from top to bottom as well as side to side, ultimately making a little star pattern in the center. Then I'll mark out where the edges of the floppy drive will be, which will ultimately become my cut lines. And not for nothing, check out that awesome Casio Mini 8 calculator. This was my father-in-law's calculator for years and years, and I absolutely adore it. Uh, at any rate, to cut out the hole for the floppy, I'm going to start by drilling some rather large holes inboard from the corners. Uh, this is so I can get the blade of the jigsaw through the metal starting in the middle of the piece. Then I'll just cut a smooth arc until I reach the cut lines that I drew earlier. And of course that arc leaves a little bit uncut in the opposite direction. So I'll have to flip around and make sure I cut towards that corner as well. And with the long sides done cut, I'll do the same thing on the short sides, only making that arc a little tighter. Uh, I just work my way towards each corner carefully and it cut out easy peasy. Uh, back on the bench, let's peel the tape off and see what our freshly sliced panel looks like. And of course, we gotta mock it up on the actual floppy. Uh, and now it, it fits great here, but I did do a bit of work with a flat file to massage it perfectly into shape. Only took about 30 minutes, but man, it fit great. And uh, let's test fit this combination on the tray that I'm ultimately going to install it to. And uh, this lip here on the front is definitely going to be a problem, but angle grinders are great at solving problems. Uh, however, angle grinders are also great at causing problems too. And this is going to remove quite a bit of rigidity from the tray, but that's a problem for future David. Uh, with the notch cut out, the floppy now fits perfectly in place. This whole crazy idea might just work. The mounting holes for the floppy drive are actually just off of its center line, so I had to measure and drill new holes in the mounting tray. So I'll just mark them up with a pencil and then I'll drill a pilot hole with a small bit and then upgrade to a larger bit to finish off. Uh, then we'll flip the drive and tray upside down, making it way, way easier to bolt in the drive. Next, I want to get to work on mounting the front filler panel somewhat permanently, and I need to make some brackets for this. Uh, I'll slice them to length and then make some measurements on both ends. Then I'll take the piece over to our metal break and give it some simple bends. I won't go all the way to a 90 degree bend, but about a 45 degree bend on each side should work. Then I'll go back over to the drill to punch some new holes so our brackets can be bolted into place. And we'll start with bolting the bracket to the filler panel first, repurposing the existing mounting bracket that we bent inwards earlier. Then I'll bolt the other side of the bracket to one of the mounting slots on the tray. The angles aren't perfectly aligned, but it's surprisingly close. And with both brackets made, that actually turned out much better than I thought it would. We still have two large pieces to mount to this tray though. The, the first is the power supply for the finch drive. I'm actually going to mount the dedicated power supply for the finch directly onto this tray. And talking with Ken Romain about this, it seems this was how they actually did it originally as well. Although the original tray that they used was not a sliding tray according to Ken, and it was just like a total pain in the butt. So I'm quite happy that we got a sliding tray on this, but at any rate, let's get that power supply in place. And it looks like it's going to work just fine sitting on the side here. Uh, finally, let's get to work on getting the finch drive itself mounted. I'm going to place it staggered back a bit to hopefully balance the weight on the tray, but also because it needs to clear the uh, filler panel mounting brackets that we made earlier. Let's do a quick mock-up and make sure that I've got everything placed just about right. And there's all three on a 19 inch rack mount tray looking absolutely proper. Uh, now these three drives are only held in place on the bottom, which is going to give us grief here in a minute. But first let's get the tray mounted in the chassis. Uh, and it initially has to go in at an angle before it gets far enough in to slip into the proper cutouts and flip to being straight. 
Uh, once mounted, I immediately had sagging and stability issues. So this stabilization bracket that ties all three drives together made all the difference in the world. It's now super rigid, slides in and out smoothly, and I think this is really going to work. The three drives and the bottom tray all kind of tie together to make this uh, box that does not want to move. So I think it's going to work. I may need to ultimately build some more support brackets to tie the drives into other hard points, but we'll have to wait until we get everything spun up and seeking first to see if that's actually necessary. And with that, the hard part is now out of the way. It's time for the easy part, wiring. Right now, it's really solidly mounted, it doesn't bow in the center, and it all fits and shuts really well. I'm really pleased with how this went from a physical standpoint. And then it was time to start wiring it up. And that was three days ago. <laughs> it's been a rough couple of days. Uh, wiring up the Finch is dead simple. The power supply is up there. Uh, all we got to do is get some AC power to it. And I do want to switch that AC power so we can turn the floppy on without the Finch spinning up. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work when it comes to termination. We'll have to figure that out the hard way. But uh, Finch, not a big deal. The floppy is where the problem is. I really want to keep this entire cabinet free from anything that's modern, which means I want to use the original power supply with the floppy. Not a problem. The floppy needs uh, AC 110 volts. We've got that switched off of the main power supply. And it needs plus 24 volts and plus five volts. Plus five volts is no sweat. We've got a ton of plus five powering the actual computer. We can just borrow off of that. The plus 24 volts is the one that's been tripping me up. The power supply I know is 100% capable of supplying plus 24 volts. It says so on the side. It's absolutely capable of giving plus 24, but I could not find it anywhere. Now there's a lot of extra uh, plugs on the side there, and there's a lot of danger going on because those plugs have AC voltage in them. That's because these plugs, particularly J1 and J2, were meant to supply power to a floppy, which is exactly what I'm trying to do. So it can supply the AC, the plus five, and the plus 24 all out of a single plug. Excellent. That's exactly what we're looking for. I have the AC, I have the plus five, I still don't have a plus 24. So I thought I was doing something wrong. Maybe I had something hooked up wrong. Maybe something is not going in the way it was supposed to go. So I did a lot of tracing back of wires on the power supply. And ultimately I just went and grabbed the spare power supply from the counterfeit Centurion. And it does have 24 volts on that connector on J1 and J2. So why doesn't my power supply have 24 volts on that connector? Well, then started a reverse engineering process that is getting slowly out of hand. I am pretty much just going to have to completely reverse engineer the 24 volt circuit of the uh, power supply. And I'm a decent way into it, but it's just, it's gonna take time. And uh, we're pretty deep into the week and my brain is very fried, so I think it's, probably for the best if I just take a deep breath, don't think about trying to get this project finished today, and just work on it with a clean, fresh brain. Um, and I think things will go a lot smoother for that. But what that means is that we have to do something that I absolutely hate doing, and that is leaving a project unfinished at the end of an episode. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, we're going to end it here today uh, and we're, we're not done with this thing, but I am not going to give up on it. I'm going to figure out why our plus 24 volts is not working on the main power supply and we're going to get that up and going and powering Curious Mark's uh, floppy drive. And by the way, if you don't go watch Curious Mark, go watch him right now. He is far better at this type of troubleshooting than I am. He, uh, he probably probably would have this figured out in an afternoon. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys so much for watching today on this uh, episode that started off with a lot of enthusiasm and ended up with me being totally defeated. But that's 
moderately par for course for this channel. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time when we bring this thing to completion.